I'm at one, changing the conversation about America's energy, economy, and environment. I'm Greg Dalton. In 2007, I went to the Arctic on a global warming expedition with scientists and journalists aboard an icebreaker. Experiencing climate change at the top of the world changed my life, and when I returned, I created Climate One as a project of the Commonwealth Club. For the last 12 years, I've been interviewing leaders about how burning fossil fuels changes all of the systems around us, our food system, our water system, our ecosystems, our lifestyle, and our economy. Climate changes everything. Today, we're discussing the land of dreams and drought. California's iconic place and global popular culture is built on the availability of water, much of it transported from far away. Over the next hour, we'll hear stories of human manipulation of water and how that story is changing in the era of climate disruption. Mark Erix is author of The Dreamt Land, Chasing Water and Dust Across California. He's a former staff writer at the Los Angeles Times and author of The King of California, J.G. Boswell and the Making of a Secret American Empire. That won a California Book Award presented by the Commonwealth Club. Faith Kearns is a scientist with the California Institute for Water Resources, where she writes about water, wildfire, climate change, and people. Her Twitter feed is quite interesting. She previously worked at the Pew <laughs> Charitable Trust. This is a good one. I don't know if I often say that. Um, and Dinah Markham is a reporter with the Los Angeles Times. In 2015, she won a Pulitzer Prize for reporting on farm workers, farmers, and others in California's drought-stricken Central Valley. She's author of The Tenth Island, Finding Joy, Beauty, and Unexpected Love in the Azores. Please welcome them to the Climate One stage. <clears throat> welcome to you all. Mark Eriks, let's begin with, you write that the invention of California was a mad act of hubris. How so? Well, we, we took the edge of a continent a thousand miles long, and we drew a line around it and called it a, a state. Um, and then we proceeded to try to make each different state of nature inside that. There's a dozen of them equal. And so that the invention of California required the invention of a system to, to uh, move the water from, you know, 750, 1,000 miles. And uh, so I think that qualifies as hubris. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And then we'll get into, um, you know, how that, so that hubris that, that you write about, you know, um, tell us a little more about, you know, that and how it's manifest with a system we've, we're living with today. Yeah. You want me to trace the system? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, it starts with the, the first taking, which is the taking of the body of the native Californian. We had the, the most, you know, concentrated, um, uh, population of indigenous uh, anywhere in North America, 300,000 natives. And when Father Sarah came up through Mexico and started his missions, that was the taking of the body of the Indian and that allowed for the taking of the rivers. And then we see Sutter coming in to Northern California, gold being dis discovered and the erecting of a system that allowed us to that's the first, you know, the mining of gold is really the mining of water first. And so you see the flumes, which are nothing but irrigation canals made out of wood. You see dams and ditches and this really intensive experiment going on to move the water so it has a great deal of erosive power to, to unearth the, the gold. And, and, and then uh, at some point in the 1880s, the silting of the rivers end up damaging doing great damage to uh, the alluvial plains, and California has a choice. I mean, the, 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 do we mine gold, do we mine soil? And so the industrialists who made all the money off gold, they end up living in Knob Hill in San Francisco and farming the hinterlands, and they plant wheat. And the wheat king back then was a gentleman named Isaac Friedlander. Six foot seven, 320 pounds. They said his stride was twice the stride of a normal man's. And he planted, he planted wheat up and down the San Joaquin Valley, the Central Valley. Had clipper ships delivering that wheat all the way to Liverpool. So that was the industrialization beginning from mountain down to valley floor. 
And then we'll get into some more of what happens on that valley floor. Diana Markov, you, during the drought, you wrote about a number of characters quite vividly uh, that earned you the Pulitzer Prize. What are some of those characters, whether it's Diana Johnson or Fred Lujan or others, that uh, tell us their story of these, uh, you vi- painted these very vivid portraits during the drought? Yeah, the three of us were just talking about um, how vividly some stories stick with you. Um, so some of them, I did write stories about the when the Pulitzer. One of them was Donna, who you mentioned. Um, it was, when the, when the drought first started, not everybody knew about it. it. It hit the outlying agricultural towns first. And there was just this incredible hardship there that people were pretty o- unaware of, even in Fresno, you know, certainly not in San Francisco and not in Sacramento where it would have maybe mattered. And um, there were people whose wells were growing dry. They, and and the, there was no civic organization, you know, responsible, no government organization, because it's your own well. So they would call, and there was nothing to be done. But people didn't, I, I don't think anybody official understood how much uh, suffering was out there. And then this one woman's well went dry. And she started thinking, well, I wonder how many other people's wells are dry. So she started going on these you know, roads that nobody drives, out to the mobile homes, out to the places that are really off, you know, off mm-hmm. the beaten track. And she found out all these people that didn't have water. And then she thought, well, as long as I'm counting, I'll bring them some water. Mm. So then in their little local paper, she had them put a, you know, a notice with her phone number and her address and said she was doing this in case anybody wanted to bring water. And the next day she came out to her house and her whole backyard and her garage was just full of pallets of water because people knew, they knew how bad it was. So that that kind of sticks with me, you know, how much just, I think, I forget how old she was. I think 72. Like 72, you know, and then people would say, oh, you're too old to be doing this. She said, don't tell me how old I am. And <laughs> I, I, it's just, just, so she did that. But there's, and, and then after, after the drought left the Central Valley and kind of moved on to the rest of California, I moved on to another project where we just, a photographer named Rob Gothy and I, we just drove around California with no particular plan. And we were kind of doing this Tumblr thing, just live to see how much the rest of California was aware of what was going on, which was then the nucleus of it. And it had hit everywhere, and there were just these random stories that would, even now are just kind of burned into my mind, like we're driving down the road and we see this old man with a bucket of water, uh, watering his rose bushes. And so we got out and talked to him for a minute, and he, it was a rose that his wife, who had died, had planted, and he was trying to keep it alive during the drought, so he would wash his dishes, and then he would use the leftover water to water this rose that meant so much to him. And the stories just kept piling up. They were married up. like 60 years or something. It was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they, they just kept piling up. All these, all these people that were making these tremendous personal sacrifices and using hardly any water. And at the same time, like that's not going to make a difference, right? All of the people that you're writing about are the ones that that are, you know, that could maybe possibly change things, but there's these other people making these just yeah. horrible, horrible choices. And we'll get into that. Some that there's a huge users of water and the and the, the small users of waters, and and there's yeah, there's a disparity in water like there is a lot of other things, wealth and power in our state and country. But I think there's also that you know there is sort of a rural small town thing that you take care of each other. So you know mm-hmm. if you're living by. Lake Orville, which is one of our lakes that provides a lot of water for California, and you're watching it go down outside your window, and you're just watching the boats on dry land, and you're watching it drop, and you know that's the water people drink, then you start throwing in and doing your part, you know? And what did one person you know do uh, do in that situation? <laughs> um, well, on this reporting trip, we had a... we had some kind of car trouble, I don't even remember what. And I'm talking, I wasn't even being a reporter, I'm just talking to the guy that's working on the car. And he had had to stop watering his garden. And he had three children that he 
you know, he fed out of the garden and it meant so much to him. And he would, it talked about how happy he was, you know, at the end of the day when he used to be able to go and take care of his plants and just spend that amount of time, how much it just meant to him as a person. But he couldn't keep doing that. He couldn't keep watering these plants while he was watching the lake outside his window drop that he knew was the water for everyone to drink. Faith Kearns, let's bring climate into this conversation. How much is you know, climate contributing to these? You know, the stress, you know, Mark Eriks has said that it's kind of crazy to build California the way it was in, the, in a certain period. Now climate is, is kind of making that equation different. How is it changing the water equation? Um, I think we have a growing sense that our, particularly our water infrastructure, was built for a very different uh, time when there was a lot more water coming down, um, and particularly snow, so precipitation in general. And so what we're seeing is that um, as temperatures warm, which every year over the past many years has been the warmest year on record and then the warmest year on record, um, that the the way that we've built our water infrastructure to essentially have these large dams that capture snow melt um, and are intended to do that gradually over the course of this the dry summer the the dry season in California um, you know is is really challenging when more of that precipitation is falling as rain and so what we saw in 2016 when we had a particularly rainy year that kind of ended the drought um, was that, you know, we ended up with an emergency at, at Oroville, right? Because there's there's too much water. Um, and so things are... This was a dam that almost burst, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of other things going on there, but it does challenge our, our basic ability to kind of think about water in the way that we've always thought about it. And why should someone outside, <coughs> excuse me, Faith Kearns, why should someone outside California who doesn't drink California water care about what happens to water in California? Hmm. You might stump me with that. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we export a lot of food. I mean, whether you think if you live in the West or Midwest, you consume a lot of California water and fruits or nuts. You yeah. don't drink California water. That's one way that the fruits and vegetables that come out of this state yeah. matters. Yeah, I can, I can see that argument for sure. Mark, <laughs> I, Mark I, I, think, what? I, think, I think we're the, you know, to use the cliche, the canary in the coal mines. You've got Florida. You've got the Mississippi. You've got California. We have this. Uh, we 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 don't na need climate change to swing wildly between drought and flood. Uh, early in my book, I list the the drought years and the flood years, and it goes on for several sentences. Uh, so when you're that inherent kind of n nature that we have, and then you add on to that, it links up to climate change. We're going to see havocs that have never been created before, and we're seeing that already. We saw it in paradise, a whole place burning off the, the California yeah. map. So, um, so I, I think we're going to be showing the, 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 the way for the rest of the country. And so I think it's important to pay attention to what California is doing, right and wrong. Well, also, don't you think we're kind of a key part of the conversation because of the Central Valley and because we have droughts and floods and right. droughts and floods, and it's natural. That's right. It's harder to convince it used to be harder to convince people about climate change because they'd say, no, this is just California. Right. This California is, being California. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's This is be... the Central Valley a little missing. <laughs> yes. I'm a farmer and, you know. I've seen plenty of droughts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and some floods, too. No, no, I think they're even, I mean, in, in chapter one of my book, a farmer flat, flat out, where he's trying to explain why my apricot trees uh, shedded all their fruit early in, in, first of all, they blossomed in January, what to call that season. Um, then they <laughs> shed in March. And then I, he says, I have to show you my pistachios. This is your friend, Brad. Brad, yeah. And, and so we go out and he says, Mark, I've been farming pistachios for 30 years. Uh, there's one male for every 24 female. That's the pattern, how they're planted. And he spanked the pods on the males and nothing was coming off. The females were ready. I laughed a little bit about that one. Um, and uh, I said, what's going on? He says, I've never seen my, my orchard this out of sync. And I said, what is it? He swallowed hard. And then he said, it's global climate change. The reason your apricots didn't hold, the reason my females and males are miscommunicating is because uh, we didn't have enough chilling hours in winter 
to put the trees totally to sleep. And so, um, yeah, so I think there's some acknowledgement now that this is beyond the crazy weather of California. It's and gotten into something else. The, word, the words, the terminology has changed so rapidly. You know, I used to work for the local paper, and we mm. didn't say global warming or climate change. No. We said, some scientists believe to yeah. be. I mean, and, and that wasn't that long ago, but I mean, now there's... I don't know, even in... I think it's really challenging. I mean, I, I got an email from a colleague the other day who works in a, a rural northern California county who is telling me it's still a non-starter for him. Yeah. Um, he's an orchard advisor to talk about climate change. Um, but then you also have, you know, um, pretty progressive growers like um, Chris Petty and, um, or Chris Sayer in uh, Ventura County who's, who's totally willing to talk about how he, he's thinking about his avocados and planting them. It's really variable. I think you're right. When Trump came to Fresno, it was one of his few California trips, you saw farmers for Trump signs, which is a, a weird thing because he was talking about closing off the border where their, you know, their labor comes from. And so you have to figure that out. But, um, you know, he, he, he told the crowd that, that the drought was not nature. It was man doing that to the farmer. And there was a lot of cheers. Hmm. So, so I think you're right that there's, there's, the awareness is just starting. Brad is a very progressive grower who challenges a lot of the ethos of, of, of the other growers. So um, I, I think he's not the, the, uh, the norm. Yeah. Well, I'd hate to have you ever, you know, agreeing with Trump, but it is partly man-made. Um, if you read your book, we... <laughs> no, <there's, laughs> I, I said that the... The crowd, <laughs> nice. the crowd stood and cheered because um, they, the spittle that was coming from mm. Trump, they mistook that as rain for a parched people. <laughs> um, but you're right. I mean, there's things going on in the Delta where man's hand is there trying to do various things that are at, you know, we're playing God in the Delta, trying to save species that suffered in our natural droughts patterns. So you're right, it's both things. Well, I just feel like your book, you know, goes back to the beginning of time. It looks at how we just changed the entire environment from the get-go. Faith yeah. Kearns, one of the, the adapt lessons of recent yeah. drought has been the push away from flood irrigation toward drip irrigation. Uh, and because a lot of people who look at those fields and say, oh, those wasteful farmers. But now there's a different change of thinking potentially about drip versus flood. Tell us how that thinking might be flipping. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. Even in reading Mark's book, I was... I, I hadn't actually thought as much um, as he talks about the fact that drip irrigation has made it easier to irrigate non-flat land in a way that I was an extra piece for me to consider. But, um, you know, for a long time, there was a focus on water efficient, water use efficiency, and that's where sort of drip irrigation technology came from, right? You used to just um, irrigate in furrows or flood or that kind of thing. And so the idea was, oh, if we can just make every drop, you know, work at, work to its fullest, then then things will be good. And then I think what's happened over time is people have seen that water use efficiency isn't the same thing as water conservation, right? So um, what people have been doing is instead of just um, using their water efficiently, they take what they have saved and apply it to something else. So there is no sort of like net water conservation happening. And then the other thing that's sort of come up in the last few years is just related to, again, and Mark has written extensively about groundwater um, withdrawal and subsidence, which is, you know, land sinking in the Central Valley. Um, and the fact that, you know, that, that um, drip irrigation is so efficient that it doesn't uh, help us to recharge groundwater in any way. Yeah. And so now what you're seeing is people making um, a move back towards studying how uh, flood irrigation, <laughs> um, back to the beginning, sort of full circle, um, can be used as a, a groundwater recharge tool. Mark, th Eric, this sounds crazy because we've done <laughs> conversations here about kind of shaming farmers for flooding and saying, no, 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 spend it's money weird. to drip and now we're going to no, go back to flooding. That's just... There's this paradox of drip. Drip... <laughs> <laughs> drip, drip has, the farmer, his yields are so much higher with drip that he takes those lines and he goes uphill now where farming never was. And then he's taking up land that is so poor that, that it wasn't even for pasturage. But because the drip can deliver a precise dose of water and chemical to a root zone, you don't need good earth. 
So they're farming. If you look at the footprint of agriculture in the Central Valley, it's gone from the primo alluvial plain soil. Uh, that was when the rivers were first taken, turned into canals. And then when the advent of the turbine pump came in 1920, the year my grandfather arrived here, then you started seeing the extraction of the aquifer, and you started seeing the footprint of agriculture go from prime land to not so prime. And now with drip, we're actually farming millions of acres of poor land. And this is the land that will probably come out of development when the groundwater regulation law goes into full effect. So are you saying that's a good thing or a bad thing? In terms of, you know, it's, it's ex making water go further, and it's getting food off of land that didn't previously produce food, but there sounds like you're not... Well, when, when the resource is finite, then you have to make choices. And so in the San Joaquin Valley, they're going to have to choose which land deserves that water. And you will see in the San Joaquin Valley, there's 6 million acres of farmland. It'll probably go down to 4.5 because they've decided to idle the land that an argument can be made, a strong argument, should have never been farmed in the first place. It's alfalfa. It's Holsteins. You know, we need to find a place other than California that where cows are truly happy because <laughs> our, our, our land and water is too valuable for Holsteins. It, a lot of them get trucked. And that's going to upset all your Azorean Portuguese <laughs> friends. With They're your, already moving. <laughs> right, right. Diana's uh, most recent book is about the Azorean Portuguese in the valley and then going, she goes back um, to, the, to the islands and, and, and that's that culture that I'm an, I'm an upset, so you're going to have to watch my back now, okay? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's this, even if it shouldn't be there, we have all of these groups, you know, all these cultures mm. that are parts of those places, those places that should have never been farmed before, are the places that people came from all over the world, and they didn't have a lot to get started. So that's exactly the places where some of our most beautiful and interesting cultures are. Yeah. And that's where our stories are. So we're not just going to lose, and I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't lose. I no, don't think no, we have right, any no, choice. But it, I mean, we're losing so much more than, you know, this many acres of drip irrigation. We're going to lose these incredibly close-knit towns, these, these cultures that, fair, like I wrote about me, the... Yeah. Fair Mead, the Black Oakies. Mm -hmm. I mean. Fair Mead's the Black Oakies uh, that... In the Azorians out in yeah. Turleri and Turlock. There's all these people that came. They came and they brought all their traditions and they lived in really isolated places and they lived together. So all of that got passed down, you know, whether they were from Mexico or whether they were from Punjab or whether they were from the Azores. And these isolated towns out in these like vast farmlands, those, those are the ones that... Yeah, they're going to wither. And those are the places you go that most people in California don't even know exist and certainly don't, certainly don't go. If you're just joining us, we're talking about water at Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. My guests are Mark Erex, Diana Markham, and Faith Kearns. Um, California has abundant water this year, but some investors are betting that water constraints in the future will drive prices upward. Rye Rivard covers water and power for the Voice of San Diego. He's reported on land and water rights purchases in Southern California that success, suggests speculation by some unusual investors. Over the past several years, a company called Renewable Resources Group has bought land in the Imperial Valley. In one case, it resold land within a couple of years for about double the price to the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which provides water to nearly 20 million people. We talked to Rai Rivard about what these secretive deals worth hundreds of millions of dollars might mean for the future of California water. If you look at the Imperial Valley in particular, it's really desert. Um, the only reason it's a big farming area is because they diverted the Colorado River into their valley. Renewable Resources Group is this Los Angeles-based company that does water, land, and energy development. Renewable came in uh, working with Harvard as the sort of silent partner, the Harvard Foundation, and uh, bought a bunch of land. They knew uh, that people were interested in the water that came with this land. We're talking, you know, multi-million dollar deals for thousands, tens of thousands of acres of land. And to have an entity come in that just isn't some uh, ancestral farmer and begin trying to market a lot of water is certainly a major development 
so much of water in California, so, so a lot of this water trading happens beneath the radar. There could be other companies that we don't even know about. There's so little fresh water in the world. Some of it's getting polluted. Uh, some of it's um, being rearranged by climate change in unpredictable ways. So betting on making money from water is a good bet. As water becomes scarcer, I think we really need to start paying more attention to who these people are, who these actors are, who these lobbyists and officials, many of them unelected are, and who these companies are. And if we don't, I think we could find ourselves subject to prices and situations and scarcity, real or artificial, that we could have prevented or dealt with or anticipated if we'd just been paying more attention. That was Rye Rivard from The Voice of San Diego. Faith Kearns, um, water markets are controversial, but uh, water is unique in some respects as both a commodity and the UN has declared a human right to water, so it's both a right and a commodity. Um, your take there on sort of you know investing, is that necessarily bad to be trading water rights? Um, so I'm not a money person, I'm an ecologist. Uh, by training. And so for me, um, yes, I think it's a bad thing. Uh, do I have some other solution per se? No. Um, I am not a huge fan of the water market conversation. Um, I think for me, what I've, you know, kind of come to over the last many years of working on this issue in California is that, um, that there, there is a lot of stuff that goes on really behind the scenes um, and that is completely uh, inaccessible to most of us, even those of, those of us who work on this topic professionally um, in a way that's pretty disturbing <laughs> for me. Um, and I think, you know, I'd actually like to see us move in a completely different direction was just back to the idea of, you know, water really as a public, re a, I don't even like the word resources, how radical I'm getting <clears throat> these days is, is um, you know, it belongs to all of us. And so this idea that you've got kind of the 1%, um, you know, capitalizing even further on this, this, you know, finite resource is incredibly disturbing to me. Um, and I am really grateful for people like Rye and, and Mark who actually spend the time to kind of figure out what's going on uh, behind the scenes. I've sat with certainly colleagues um, who might even be in the room talking about how we feel, you know, like, our, our hands are tied behind our backs a little bit because we aren't operating in that same financial space that other people are and we're kind of running around um, trying to do the best we can but also these forces are so much bigger than any of us. Um, Mark Erics, we live in an economy where most everything is, is you know, traded. There's marketplaces for all sorts of things, you know, parking spaces, et cetera. But somehow water, people seem to think differently about water. Um, I'm, I'm, selling water it, it 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 is a problem it's it it it, it um, you know it's all it belongs to all of us but this water like Imperial it was captured it was captured before 1914 they have these rights to use that water beneficial use and we have uh, I won't get into all the complexities of it but we have this very weird water law out here it's a combination of appropriative rights in other words that you could take a river and take that water via canal to some farmland far away if it's beneficial use and then also you can use it along the riparian corridor riparian rights and we have a kind of combination of those two selling water um, I, I don't mind if it's farmer selling to farmer what really bothers me is farmer selling to city and we're going to see because the, the farmer can never compete with the cities for that water and if that water leaves the farm belt and ends up going up and over the mountains so LA can be, build more you know houses across the desert um, that's to me a problem um, but that's the farm boy in me uh, going back a few generations talking uh, maybe when we get to Q&A we can tease that out a little bit because you know, there's a whole, yeah, the sort of urban coastal versus the inland farming tension in California water wars. There's yeah. a lot there. But this um, kind of stuff goes beyond that. I mean, that this is dystopian. This is people trying to make billions and billions of dollars on there not being enough water to even drink. I mean, I was there when the UN came to some of the smaller towns in the East Valley. I mean, yeah. the UN came to California because people don't have drinking water. I mean, how... <laughs> Yeah. With you. 
So that I, how can we even discuss it? I, I, I have like, it's hard for me to even think of it in a calm sort of way because I just have these snapshots. I mean, I, I remember the first time all the almonds came in. Do you remember? We were having dinner and we were both exhausted because we'd both been um, covering drought forever. And there was just this one moment where it's like, who's putting these almonds in? Where's the water coming from? This was like the absolute height of the drought. And yeah. every time you drove down the road, here were more. And at the same time, it was the same year that the UN is in another part of the valley because people don't have drinking water. And person after person is getting up and saying, I spend 30% of my the money that I make as a farm worker. I mean, they're, they're really physically going thirsty. They don't have enough water to drink. They can't give their babies baths. And in the same time, you've got these backroom deals that you're tra tracking yeah, down. Yeah, I mean. And we, I mean, it's just a snapshot in my head, this moment. I could like see us in the window and how scared we looked because I we remember were. that evening. Yeah, no, I mean. The, the water, I still am. The water became a means by which the, the, the valley became one of the most unequal places in the world. But now they're treating it like oil. They're just going to be trading it. Yeah. So, so that's something that we have to confront. H how those trades happen. Um, are you allowed to sell to urban at some, you know, already so there's a, well, there's a farmer named Vitovich. He's not really a farmer. He's a developer from Silicon Valley who's come <clears throat> up and over the mountain to the San Joaquin Valley. And he's buying up all this farmland, but he, he doesn't care much about the farmland. He's farming temporarily. It's the water. And he's already sold uh, a chunk of it for $75 million to the folks in Mojave so they can continue to grow. It's, you know, I don't want to date myself, but in, in, in my lifetime, the, the population of California has gone from 11 million to 40 million. And the system wasn't designed for that. The system's certainly not going to see us into a future of more houses and more almonds. So something has to give. And, and the system is cracking. And that's what I basically do in my book. I go inside those cracks, both historical and present, big farmers, small, and try to figure out, you know, how did we get to this madness? And where is this madness taking us? And Mark Eric, one place you got where very few people have, have uh, been able to go is you know into the the empire of, of Stuart uh, Stuart Resnick. Uh, you know he started out uh, at UCLA waxing floors, bought a alarm company, sold for a hundred million dollars. This is a secretive billionaire farmer. Tell us about the Resnicks and how you got inside and into their their secretive world. Well, Stuart Resnick and I have one thing in common: our fathers were both bar owners. Um, so. <laughs> We, I was there. able to trade on that. He came from New Jersey, a Jewish kid, comes west, uh, becomes a millionaire at UCLA Law School, was at UCLA Law School, and then you, you can read how he accumulates that. In the 70s, he decides he needs a hedge, hedge against inflation. He comes to Delano, which is one of the civil rights datelines of America, right? It's where Cesar Chavez's movement began, and he buys some farmland there, and, and then he buys the farmland from the oil companies who didn't care about farming anyhow. And pretty soon he's the biggest grower of pistachios, almonds, mandarins, and pomegranates in the world. He lives in Beverly Hills and his farming empire up and over the mountain exists in a place called Lost Hills. It's 80 miles as the crow flies, couldn't be farther. And um, so I get inside his whole empire uh, and it's not just his, it's what his wife, Linda, mm -hmm. is a marketing genius. She came up when, when they put the bowl of mandarins, the first crop of mandarins in front of her, and they could peel them very nicely, and they tasted sweet. Uh, she, well, we have to come up with a name for this. And so she came up with the name Cuties. And then the partner that they had, they got into a big war, and the partner ended up buying the Cuties for $40 million. And so she just turned around and invented the halos. And now in, in the, in, in, on the land of the valley, we have a war going on between the cuties and the halos. <laughs> and, and you write that, at, you know, at some point the story gets creepy. Where does it get creepy? <laughs> oh, we haven't creeped you out enough already? No, no. So the Resnicks... Um, after about 30 years of farming, they figured out we've got to give back. And they give, they're giving back in a major way. She stopped the major donations to the, the, the hospitals of L.A. 
and the, and the museums, and much of their money is now going into improving the lives of farmers and farm, ch farm workers, and, excuse me, farm workers and their children. And so she's, she's founded, it's like 70 million a year some years, so she has founded these charter schools mm -hmm. um, and doing some extraordinary things. And then they're, they're fighting diabetes in a way that no one's ever fought it. And that's where it gets a little creepy. She's getting into, she really seems to care what, yeah. she's got a few thousand workers, what they eat. And right, no, 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 they have. It's on a health it's, it's a yeah. wellness, a wellness. It's a yeah. whole wellness program, yeah, yeah. And, and it's to be admired, a lot of it. But it gets into social engineering at some point where they're, they're really telling them to stop eating tortillas. That's a tough one. And then bef she serves at their, at, their, at their processing plant. They have this incredible restaurant that serves wild salmon. And they do cauliflower in ways I've never seen. It's so creative. Yeah. But what she's doing now is she believes, and there's obviously lots of science, that everything about us begins in our guts. So she's trying to change the biome of the worker's guts. And so before they eat, she's asking them to drink a little concoction. And that concoction is made of Bragg's apple cider vinegar. Cutie juice, no, no, halo juice, <laughs> um, ginger, turmeric. And so it gets a little weird. No yeah. Palm Wonderful? No, the Palm Wonderful is for another occasion. That, uh -huh. that does, that, that, that's for your prostate when you, that has problems, okay. <laughs> <laughs> If you're just joining us, we're telling stories about water and the California dream and how that relationship is changing in the era of climate change. Our guests are Mark Eriks, author of The Dreamt Land, Chasing Water and Dust Across California. Dinah Markham, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter with the Los Angeles Times. And Faith Kearns, a scientist with the California Institute for Water Resources. We're going to go to our lightning round and ask you to just respond quickly. To, I'll mention a noun and get your first response to what, what comes to mind. One word or phrase that comes to mind. First for Mark Eriks. What comes to mind when you hear William Mulholland, the civil engineer who designed the aqueduct that brings water to Los Angeles? The first great stealing, you know. First great stealing? The stealing, the theft, the um, theft. Faith Kearns, science instilled with aloha. Oh, boy. Um, comes to mind. What comes to What's mind? What's lightning? Lightning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> aloha yeah. is not a quick hit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Solidarity. Uh, Faith Kearns, climate grief. Uh, deep well. Uh, Diana Markham, Belize. I'm sorry, I didn't. Belize. Belize? Belize. Oh, Belize. Belize oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, so this is really embarrassing since I'm writing a book set in Belize. I just misunderstood <laughs> the word. <laughs> um, the Mayans and drought. We'll get to that. Uh, Mark Eric's uh, water markets. A possible solution. Possible. Uh, mm. True or false, uh, Faith Kearns, you have pure dread about the California fire season now. Oh, very true. Uh, Mark Eric's true or false, during the recent California drought, some reporters played to the trope that the land was drying out. Mm, that's true. There was a paradox again happening. Also, uh, Mark Eriks, true or false, the real story was that amid the drought, there were record crops from trees and fields. That's true. Uh, true or false, Dinah Markham, before the drought, you used to play with your dog Murphy in a water hose. Mm. True. <laughs> That's okay. Um, if you also, knew Murphy, that you'd know. <laughs> yeah. Does uh, also, anybody have a lab here? I mean, you understand, right? Um, also, Diana Markham, true or false, during the drought, you were afraid you would never see the snow on the mountains again near your home. It was absolutely true. And I, I mean, I'm, it's so amazing to me now. Like, even though I know that it's just a little reprieve and that it's, you know, coming, it's coming back again, I know, but just if you're a Californian now this spring to have driven around and seen those hills green and to see water in the lakes and to see snow on the mountain, I mean, there was just a time that I, I thought I didn't look close enough. I, I think that's one thing I took away from the drought was like during it, I kept thinking, I wish I would have paid more attention. I wish, I wish I could picture the snow. I wish I could picture the grass. So right now I'm trying to work, look so hard that it almost hurts. We'll get back to, to that. Yeah, enjoying this, this right. year, knowing that it's, it's uh, ephemeral. 
Um, true or false faith currents, climate scientists should receive training in grief, similar to doctors, caregivers, and humanitarian aid workers. True. Um, Diana Markham, uh, speaking of grief, uh, you attended the 2015 White House Correspondents' Dinner where President Obama ridiculed Donald Trump, who was in the audience. True. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mark Eric's true or false, Bruce Springsteen wrote a song based on an article you did about farm workers cooking meth on the side to make ends meet. That's true. A colleague and I did a piece on that, and I got a call saying, would you help him write some lyrics? So that's how hydriotic acid got into that song. I, no one has ever put hydriotic acid into a song. <laughs> but that's his, he, he's, he likes to get real, so... That's what I discovered. So Bruce Springsteen called you? No, uh, uh, his Terry McGovern, his manager, called me. Okay. And this was the day of fax machines. So we went back and forth because Bruce wanted more details. For Tom Joad. Uh, true or false, Diana Mar Markham, billionaire farmers Stuart and Diane Resnick are always inviting you out to their farm. Well, the, not to their farm, but to, I, to, I get a lot home. of press releases for you know all of their good works. Uh, also, by, by, but Diana, you stay away from people with money and power. Oh, I, I mean, not tonight. But, <laughs> 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 but as a journalist, it's not my <laughs> favorite thing yeah. to write about. <laughs> uh, last one, because that's Mark's thing. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> This, he does everything, uh, he, he's I, all I, up and down. I happen to have done stories on more billionaires than I ever thought possible. Okay, Eli Broad, uh, Resnick, Boswell. Um, so I've, I've, You've got a thing. Yeah, I don't know what's going on, I'm, but I, I, th I think it's ending. It's, <laughs> yeah. All right, let's give them a round of applause for getting through the... Um, So I want to get finished before we get to the audience part of it, but that the emotional piece, so much of the climate conversation is in our heads. Um, Diana, you covered the rim fire and you said you were changed forever. And I'd also like to give you a little more space to talk about the emotional impact of the joy of this wet year and the beauty, but knowing it won't last. Yeah. Um, so when I was covering the drought, it starts slow and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse until it had overtaken my life without me even realizing it. I think that's about the time, this is the first time I'm meeting faith in real life, but there was, um, I was on Twitter a lot at that time because I was a reporter and I was covering wildfires and I was covering drought and this little group of people kind of that I didn't know but were out there started talking to me and <laughs> sort of feeding me like the things I needed to know but more than that there was the support because it, it did feel like we were first responders on a really tragic thing and um, so I'd been covering drought and I'd been seeing all of these traumas, and I'd also been seeing all this resilience and hope and the best of humanity, so it was just, it was moving on all levels. And then I think probably about when I was as tired as I thought I could be, the rim fire broke out, which, you know, now we've been through paradise. Yeah. But I think what was scary about the rim fire, even at the time, was that I knew paradise was coming. Yeah. You know, it was, so we were in a little town where you could see it. It's right on the edge of Yosemite. And every night, um, these, this cloud, you know, fires, they create their own weather. And this, this cloud comes up. And inside the cloud, there's lightning that starts more fires. It's, you can explain it better than I can probably. But the bottom line is it is just hellishly scary. So... And it comes every single evening. So we were staying in this cute little town, you know, with the white picket fences and the, have you seen my lost dog? And, mm. you know, we're open tonight at 5.30, but we don't have enough corn for everybody, so come early. You know, life. Life is all around you. There's geraniums in the flower box. It's, it's there. But at the same time, certain time of night, we'd all walk out into the middle of the road and just wait for this gigantic cloud to come up that's just larger than if you haven't seen it with your own eyes I can't I don't know if I can have you've both seen them right I mean they just it towers it's it's taller than the it's taller than the Sierras and um, 
And at the time, the firefighters didn't know if they would be able to fight it. And it was the first time I'd ever heard firefighters even admit to the possibility of defeat. So I don't think that's ever going to leave me. Yeah, that stayed. Faith Kearns, you're writing a book about sort of, you know, scientists are trained to leave emotion out of their work, and yet there's grief coming in. If you can't look at the climate reality and not have dark moments. So you're, tell us about your work trying to bring the emotional dimension into scientists, which they're trained that that's flimsy and that, that's, there's no place for that. Yeah, I mean, it was actually working on fire. Um, I used to work at a fire center at UC Berkeley. I mean, it was working on fire that actually really um, galvanized for me that this was a huge issue um, because I was up in Wairika in the northern part of the state in a you know a fairly rural town. And we were doing, I, I work for UC Cooperative Extension. We do a lot of field days and things like that. And so I was out, um, we were doing a fire safety demonstration thing and um, giving presentations and things. And this man actually came up to me after um, our group presentation and he kind of had tears in his eyes and he was really like, I, I didn't even understand, I, I was so out of what was happening with, out of sync with what was happening with him. I couldn't even understand fully what he was telling me at the time, even though I really should have been able to recognize he was telling me that we had traumatized, re-traumatized him because mm. that community had been through a wildfire, a pretty bad set of wildfires, which Mendocino County has had many times, but um, just a few months before we were there. And we kind of walked in being like, hey, here's how to you know keep your house from burning down in a fire without ever recognizing that these people had just been through this. There were feelings of guilt and shame and sadness and all of this stuff that, that really made it so that the, the research that we were trying to talk about was completely ineffective because it wasn't in any way what we would now call the sort of trauma-informed perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't only think about grief. I think there are many emotions wrapped up in sort of what's happening in our world. And I am a big advocate of making room for all of those. And I think part of that is, is scientists who are are generally trained to think of subjectivity and, and our emotional selves as completely separate from our work, that that, that, that concept is actually harming um, our scientific work, particularly for those of us who work in this very community-engaged issue and on things that directly affect people's lives. So saying how bad it is, sort of there's a, the rap against is science is like focusing on the doom and gloom that that either turns people off. I mean, on the right, I've learned that people on the right just say that's liberal whining and, and it doesn't reach them. And other people feel completely overwhelmed and numbed. And so that's not that 30 years of dispersing facts, yeah. professing, uh, forecasting doom has moved people somewhat, but it hasn't solved the problem yet. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm less, you know, focused on sort of persuasion than I am on just the idea that um, we're facing these issues where what's happening for scientists internally is actually a valuable thing to kind of understand so that when we're interacting with with people on some of these really emotional issues that we're more available and that there's a, a deeper set of possibilities there, kind of the way a therapist would work with the, that deep emotional material. Mark Eriks, you, you write about a lot of characters who've sort of, you know, prevailed over nature and building this this system that you say is mad. I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on this. A lot of people, farmers have, have lived through droughts before, their granddad did, et cetera, but climate makes it different. It does. I mean... <clears throat> we don't know where it's going because once it links up and I, and I got a sense of that. Um, I spent, um, three months up in paradise, uh, telling that story, not just in the town, but in the, in the, in the forest. Um, that's your next article or yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be coming out in two weeks in California Sunday magazine. And it, you'll see how that tragedy played out over decades, how it, how it, the, the, the things that the interlocking factors, that that made tragedy happen um and in the town is built the top a geologic chimney and it was a you know they called it the town of paradise but it really was a city with all its suburban sprawl so it was in in the wildland urban interface we've got almost 10 million californians living yeah, we have so many other paradises yeah yeah there's a bunch of them Diana Markham, I want to give you a chance to talk about, you're currently working about uh, the Mayan civilization, two droughts there. Tell us what you, the, 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 you know, the nut graph of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, some hope. <laughs> okay, this isn't entirely depressing then. So I, 
I, I'm working on a story about butterflies and bullies and uh, some quirky characters, but while I was working on this book, I started looking more into the Mayans because that's how all the ruins were, and I met some people that were doing all the research. And what they're finding, you know, when I was a kid, the big mystery was what happened to the Mayans. It's, they pretty much now know that it was drought and that it was the ground subsiding. But what's, what I'm finding really interesting is the latest research shows that they had two major droughts. They had a drought that was much worse than the one that toppled the civilization. And they survived it. They lived through that. And then this other drought, this other great drought came and they I mean, an entire civilization that, by the way, was much bigger than anything we ever thought before. I mean, have you guys seen it lately? It's like all of Belize, big hunks of Mexico. Um, it disappeared, just boom. And they think the difference was income inequality. It's, this, it's the things we're talking about, that the mm -hmm. first drought, they didn't have all of the fountains and the lakes. They were all for for everyone to enjoy together, and everybody lived in fairly modest homes. But the second drought, this sort of um, rich upper class had risen, and they had these mansions, and they had deforested, you know, large swaths of acreage, and they had built their own personal fountains and their own personal rivers, and they just didn't have the resources when the time came, and they disappeared. But but I, I kind of find hope in that because... You do? <laughs> <laughs> because they lived through a worse one. I, I got, I've sort of found hope in your book. I mean, yeah. they're, they're all like, they're, they're horrible people. Yeah. But look what they did, you know? Like, yeah. if, if those guys with the, the amount of education they had, you know, was able to do all that for just greed, like, <laughs> maybe there's a little chance that we could save the world with a higher purpose. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> you said to have fun. I'm trying yeah, yeah, no, no, to add no, 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 like a little fun. hope here. <laughs> yeah, no, I think hope's I'm good. I'm having visions of the, lor the Lorax for sure. <laughs> um, we're talking with Mark Eric, Dinah Markham, and Faith Kearns at Climate One. We're going to go to audience questions, invite you to join us at the microphone there, briefly identify yourself, and uh, present one comment or question. Oh, yeah. And I'm here to help you keep it brief if you need that. Um, let's go. Welcome to Climate One. Good evening. I'm Patricia Port, and I want to thank all of you for the work that you are, have done and are doing. Since we've established that water flows uphill to money, there are two topics I'd like you to just briefly address that we haven't heard about. One is flood irrigation for rice and the impacts on the uh, flyover, and selenium. Who'd like to tackle that? I'll give, the, I'll give one of them at least a shot. Um, so the rice growers are, use a lot of water, but they're in a very water-rich area in, Sa in the Sacramento River Delta. So uh, what, you're, what you're seeing is, is they have now started to take some of their tailwater and they're sending it down the bypasses, those, those, those alleyways along the river that used to be alluvial plain. And they're actually helping grow fish because those places are very nutrient rich. Um, so, and they're also t selling water at not a crazy, crazy high price to nut growers in the, in the San Joaquin Valley. They're, they're having some difficulty getting that water through the, 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 the pinch in the Delta, the, 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 the environmental regulations, but they're doing that. So, um, you know, I've already made enemies of the alfalfa growers. Um, we, we should be a little kinder to the rice guys a selenium, I mean, that's the story of the Westlands Water District, which I call the whale. I have three chapters on, on the Westlands, and that's the story of selenium and Kesterson. How many of you remember Kesterson, the tragedy of Kesterson? Yeah. Tell us what the, briefly what the Kesterson tragedy was. Well, the, the farmers were trying to drain their tailwater off that land because it was it was bubbling up and perching the water table and destroying their crops and so they couldn't get it all the way to the ocean so they sent it um, a, a third of the way there to a place called the Kesterson Wildlife Refuge the ponds were there and they were killing ponds um, uh, birds were flying seeing the beautiful blue thinking wow this is inviting going nesting 
having babies that were coming out with these grotesque deformities. And they had to shut down Kesterson, stop the, um, the, the drainage off that land and retire some farmland that was the most impacted by the salt and selenium. Uh, it's industrial agriculture, a lot of impacts. Let's go to our next question. Welcome. Hi, sorry in advance for the broad question. Um, if I was a fairy godmother and I gave you all the resources you wanted, all the political support you needed, as well as public will, what would you do to hit the reset button on California's relationship to water in short, like creating a more resilient infrastructure? And I know this is a massive question, so even just a one element response would be great. <laughs> Do you want me to give my uneducated one while you guys yes. format your big one? Dynamo okay, they'll, they'll do the system thing, but I, I would take that money, and we have hundreds of thousands of people in California that don't have drinking water. I think I would start, you know, I'd do concentric circles. I think the first thing to do would make sure that everybody in the state has drinking water. Then you guys can take it. Well, and a bill, a bill has just done that, so we're, we're going we're gonna to see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, I mean, we, it wouldn't take very much. I mean, there's towns that only have, you know, four or 500 people, and they are all putting their quarters in those little windmill machines to get enough water to drink. I mean, third we could take $1,000 there, and that would take so much pressure off of those people that don't even have, you know, water to take baths and things. But, I mean, that's, that's not taking yeah. care of the problem. I would just I would that, that's take some of your money, money and do a, that yep. first. What would you guys do to fix it, though? <laughs> Faith Crunch? I mean, for me, the question isn't so much about money. I mean, I think we need a fundamental just rethink of our relationship with water in the state. Um, I would even go so far as probably to think a little bit along the lines of what a lot of my sort of humanities and social science colleagues would say, which is thinking about water having agency, basically, um, you know, and that, um, yeah, that we need to think we need to think of water as having its own agency and and less about our control of it and what it can do for us, and that that's a pretty fundamental reset. So, yeah, it would be. Welcome to Climate One. Evening. My name is Noah Oppenheim. My, my, the background of my question is many here are familiar with the John Wesley Powell concept that state boundaries in the Western Empire should have been formed around watersheds. What's great, what's stupid about that concept? And secondarily, how might we remap the politics of water in this modern era? Well, we did that. If you look at the original uh, creation of the valley, you'll see that they took their own rivers, their own backyard rivers, and diverted, unfortunately, they diverted 95% of the flow to agriculture. And once you do that, it's very hard to take it back. So I think um, in the valley, in the central valley, there was respect to develop only, remember, everyone wants to say uh, the, the middle of California is desert. Well, by rainfall it is, but by that incredible miracle of the Sierra, it isn't. We've got those rivers running across and they ended up taking those rivers. I think LA is an example of what you're going beyond Powell where the LA River was puny. They ended up using it by the 1890s and then it became this idea that to grow, we're gonna have to steal. And that became the first theft. And then when the valley farmers had run out of their river water or had, had taken it all and then taken what they could from the earth, then they looked at LA and said, hey, if LA can go afar and get their river, we can do the same. And that's when they went up to Sacramento and took the flows of the Sacramento with Northern California agreeing at the time because the Sacramento was a flood r risk great, great floods. So yeah, we'll give you some of our flood. We'll move, we'll solve our flood problem. You'll solve your drought problem. Well, it's obviously gotten a lot crazier since then. Welcome to Climate One. Hi, Jim Blake. Uh, Mark Arick, your book is The Dreamt Land. There's another uh, iconic book by a Mark. That's Mark Reiser's book, Cadillac Desert. Um, how does your book relate to that? Is it an update to it? Do you no. Do you contradict it? Should I read both or just stick with reading your book? <laughs> Unfair question. Uh, I got a note from 
Reisner's wife afterwards that who, you know, we, and we had this very conversation. Um, thank goodness he stayed out of California for the most part. His was about the entire West. There were three chapters about California. Um, and I stole from one of those. I did my own stealing, um, but, but both credit. So I, I think his is a, a, a bigger deal. M m mine is California alone, so it allows me to get really deep into California. And I do it with not just reportage on the land today. It's not a historical kind of rendering like his is. I also bring memoir, my own family's story on into it, and then history. So there are two different books. Um, and um, I was very much shaped by his book, and, and that's why I went the other way. Classic book. Um, Faith Kearns, for people who live in, in the American West, you know, we're talking about issues in, in California, but these issues, some of them apply beyond the boundaries of California. Um, talk to us about fire and affecting water quality. There's, you know, the American West has been on fire lately. How does that affect water quality? Because we talk about, kind of, sometimes we talk about fire, we talk about water, let's talk about them together. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's been a really interesting evolution in my sort of career. I've been out of, you know, I've been a professional for 15, 20 years at this point. And, um, you know, when I was in graduate school, there were people who were sort of like, oh, I wonder how water affects riparian areas. So, you know, the near stream and fish and things like that. And that was kind of as far as it went. And even that was a very small field of study. And I think, you know, what we're seeing right now is this really interesting thing where um, fire is it sort of moved out of urban areas, you know, after the 1906 earthquake, we learned how to sort of keep houses from building, burning down in urban areas, moved into this sort of wildland fire, urban interface thing. And now what we're seeing is that fire is actually um, maybe beginning in, in a wildland area, but then burning down you know, it becomes an urban conflagration. And that has brought up a whole new set of water concerns in the last few years that just are completely new in a lot of ways. Um, every day, um, I'm reading stories about the, the water system um, in, in Paradise. And that was true in the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa as well, that, you know, there, were ben there was benzene found in the water system. And, and we're seeing the same thing in the campfire. And there are academics who are critiquing even the, the protocols of what, how the state measures whether water is considered safe. Um, so I think we're going to see, you know, more than just the idea that if if it's wetter, maybe we won't have as much fire or maybe we'll have more because there's more grass. It's really getting into this much more sort of what I think about as a public health issue um, where it's, you know, it's not only smoke and all these things that are happening with fire, but it is also literally, you know, really becoming a broad public health issue with water implications that are much deeper than I think many of us had had uh, thought even and just a couple of years ago. Some of these fires are burned so hot that they burn underground PVC yep. plastic water piping. And yep. then people have to re-plumb re a whole community. They dig up their water pipes. It's just yep. mind-boggling how hot the fires are and, and, and what they're affecting. Yep. Um, let's go to our last question. Welcome. Hi. Um, this might be kind of long, but um, so you've spoken a little bit to the resonics, but like, I guess some of the supposedly more positive sides, but they're also like involved with the, you know, could you maybe address some of the other aspects like their control of like the current county water bank or yeah. even Fiji water or like the way they farm parts of the Westlands that don't make ecological sense to farm at all, really? And uh, another thing... Um, let's, let's wrap it. Let's like, I'm ask that, Keon, okay? Sure. Let's, so the, the other aspects of the, of the Resnicks. So the Resnicks... I have a lot of acres in Western Kern. This is an unusual place because there are no rivers running through it and there's no groundwater, at least no groundwater that, that you can use. So the residents rely wholly on the state aqueduct. But what happens when drought comes and those deliveries are zero? Well, that became a problem for Resnick and to try to um, help with that, he ended up um, in Monterey, um, his people ended up in a meeting with the state and, and this water bank that we had all paid $74 million for got traded to Resnick. Basically, he controls it. And a water bank is simply a, a big, big swath of land where it's really porous. And so if you take flood water and flood years and put it on that land, it sucks it up. But there's a membrane down below the earth that keeps the water inside there so it doesn't migrate out. And if you get some good flood years, he can store a million acre feet of water 
in that water bank and give himself groundwater. The problem in the drought, by year three, four, he had run out of that water. And that's when there was some thievery going on with water. Um, thievery is probably too harsh. It was trading, let's say. Somewhere between, something between trading and thievery. <laughs> But it was a secret pipeline that I found that was running from two counties away across the old Tulare Lake Basin into Resnick's fields. So yes, there's, um, you know, the, easy to paint evil. It's the easiest thing. It's a little tougher to paint these kind of complications. And the Resnicks really present a full picture of complications. Uh, but thank you for pointing that out. And they also own Fiji water. Let, let's go yeah. to our, um, which has its own set of issues. Uh, let's go to our last question. Welcome. Hi, thanks so much. This has been so fascinating in terms of the history and the vivid stories that you've portrayed. I'm wondering a little bit about who's making decisions about water. So who are, what does the governance structure look like <laughs> and how do you influence it? Given many of the comments that you've made, it might make one wonder, you know, who's in charge of this thing? It's great. It's great. <laughs> go ahead. Uh -huh. I, think, I think you. Go ahead. Yeah. I'll, I'll start out yeah. to just say that. Um, very good question, Juliet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, uh, so for me, I think one of the challenges has been that water is this very has become this very technocratic discussion um, where there's a really high price to entry for the conversation. And that is um, really problematic. I, I, when I talk to people about water, they always kind of, people always want to talk about water. People really care about water. But then it immediately turns into this like, well, I, I don't know anything about it. And it's like, but, but Diana shows, you know, people have these really intimate, beautiful relationships with water. We all know about water. And so somehow that discrepancy between the sort of technical entry point to even have a say in the water system has to get closer to that like intimate use of water. And so I'm a big advocate, and I've said this many times, that I think there needs to be the, the essentially a a people's water movement in the state and going back to the idea that this really is a, a, a resource that belongs to the public. Um, and that, that doesn't, you know, that's a very pie in the sky set of thoughts, but, um, but I think we have to reduce the barrier of entry to sort of how people are allowed to enter the water conversation. That's fundamental to me. And we have to wrap up this water conversation again, saying that you know water is a human right. It is also a commodity, it's, and it's balancing those two things. We have to wrap it up there. I'd like to invite you um, to join a reception out in the foyer where Mark will be signing books. And we ask that after the program, we're going to go behind stage and take off our mics and invite him to allow him to get out to uh, the ta table where he will sign books. Um, I received an email today from Felicia Marcus. Speaking of who makes this water decisions, I, I received an email today from. Felicia Marcus, longtime chair of the State Water Board, who wanted to be here, unable to be here, but she was raving about what a beautiful book it is, um, uh, The Dreamt Land. Also, like to invite you to um, participate in our Let's Talk Climate uh, campaign. We have these. Uh, these signs out there for you can take a photo, just put them on social media to get people to start talking about climate. Uh, just have the conversation, what is uh, oftentimes people don't like to talk about climate. If you're hungry about more insightful conversations about climate, um, tune in tonight on your way home on KQED Radio. You'll hear my conversation with Christine Pelosi and two Republican former congressmen, Carlos Curbelo of Florida and Ryan Costello of Pennsylvania, talking about the politics of climate and oil nationally. I get to sit up here with these fabulous people and have these uh, illuminating conversations. It really takes the whole crew to make this happen. I want to thank Adam and Billy and Brian and Ed, Justin, Justin one, Justin two, Kelly, Lena, Sarah, Catherine, Spencer, Steve, and Tyler. Let's give them a round for making today possible. <clears throat> Thank you.
On Climate One today, we've been talking about the history and future of freshwater in California and the American West with Mark Eriks, author of The Dreamt Land, Chasing Water and Dust Across California, and with Diana Markham, Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter with the Los Angeles Times, and Faith Kearns, scientist with the California Institute for Water Resources. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you podcast. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating and review. I'm Greg Dalton. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you See you next time, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.